Associate Professor in the Department of Community Sustainability here at Michigan State University. It's my pleasure to uh, uh, welcome you to this session. Uh, I'll be moderating the next, uh, the next session of the symposium, but it's certainly a great pleasure to have so many of you uh, here from across the country and around the world to join us for this discussion of the fate of the Earth. Our second speaker today is Dr. Marina Fischer-Kowalski, who is founder and director of the Institute of Social Ecology in Vienna, and she is also professor of social uh, ecology at Alpen Adrian University. Her speech is titled, The Anthropocene, Humans Lock In with Fossil Fuels and Need to Change Paths. A fuller biographic sketch of uh, Dr. Fischer-Kowalski is in the program, so uh, I will uh, welcome her to the podium, please. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be able to speak to you. I'm a little hesitant to start after Dennis, but I made sure that I put no images in my speech. <laughs> and I will take a little bit more of a social science perspective that's not so common in that uh, field because I'm originally a sociologist. So what I will talk about. First, I will talk about the grand socio-metabolic regimes of human history and how they mold our impact upon her Earth. Population dynamics of these regimes, human affluence as energy affluence, I think I reflect quite something of what has been said before. Technology as mitigating or as aggravating our impacts on Earth. And finally, I have some better news for you for the 21st century. So, I start very similar to Dennis, start with the Anthropocene. There's a new journal now out, Anthropocene Review, that will appear, I think, in two, one week or so. It's just about to come out. I'm, I have the honor to be co-editor of it, and this gave me the opportunity to go into this field which I have the pleasure to talk about today. So, when and why did we come a planetary force? There's the idea that this happened with the Neolithic Revolution, with agriculture, that it happened with the Industrial Transformation, that it might even only be termed or looked at an event linked to the Great Acceleration after the Second World War, or what I and we are trying to show it has directly to do with the use of fossil fuels, but they start in the 16th century and not in the 18th. Okay, so grand socio-metabolic regimes, you are all aware of these terms. Hunters and gatherers, they transited by the Neolithic transition that happened in all of the world except for Australia into becoming agrarian societies. Then we had a fossil fuel transition, making us in a part of us industrial societies. And we believe this transition that we are facing now will be of the same grave dimension as the, as the transitions we've had. I also try to use the well-known IPAT model to look at our impact upon Earth, but I do it in a slightly different way. I think we have to look at each of these socio-metabolic regimes and their impact. We don't have a homogenous human impact across history on Earth, but our impact changes with the way we live. And each of these regimes means a very different living. And so the formula becomes a little bit more complex. How can you distinguish human history in a way that helps you picking these regimes apart that coexist over so long time? Well, I will try to explain. First, you have to understand the regimes, how they function. You have to achieve a deeper qualitative uh, understanding of this function. Second, you, now there are very good population estimates across time. I, we base our work on them, but then you have to disaggregate them according to regimes. 
And you, then you have generate a measure of affluence that you require for the iPad equation, which says impact is population times per capita affluence times technology per unit affluence. So our choice is use energy affluence. It would make much sense to use GDP to 10,000 years backward. And finally, you have to describe the technology by which this affluence is generated and used in a quantifiable way. It's always very hard to quantify technological change. We have our choices, and what we say is how much carbon do we emit per unit energy we generate. That's the measure of technology change. So I go into it with the first subject, a qualitative understanding of these regimes and their dynamics. So I start with population. Hunters and gatherers have low fertility, low growth, low population density, are migratory usually, and have a very low labor burden. So the original affluence, if you remember from anthropology studies. Agrarian, in contrast, have high fertility, high growth. The first urban centers emerge. They are sedentary, and they have a high labor burden. And the longer they are in a region, the higher the labor burden becomes, as Esther Bozerup was uh, keen on showing. Industrial, we have a very low fertility, lower than both others. We have a high life expectancy. We have a negative growth of population. We have a rapid urban growth. And our negative growth of population has to do with our mode of wage labor and education. So that's the population differences. They are pretty substantial. Affluence. We use an indicator for affluence that is not the usual TPES that you are probably used to because in order to portray hunter and gatherers and agrarian cultures, you have to take into account the biomass they use for feed and food. And so the DEC adds these estimates of biomass consumption for feed and food to the TPS practically. So hunter-gatherers live by passive solar energy use. They let the sun shine and harvest the fruits in, in terms of animals and and, bioma and, and and plants that they can get, but they use firewood, and that's very important because that allows them to eat less. Firewood, cooking food, allows us to use much less energy on digestion, so we have a, an evolutionary advantage over other primates, if you will, which is very important from the beginning, and it also means that we have to bring the food home to the fire, which means we socialize the eating, which means we learn languages. So it makes a lot of difference, much more than this tiny little line there. The agrarian societies, they make active solar, solar energy use. That is, they cha change the land cover to grow those plants that they want to have and they have domestic animals, and both means a lot of energy consumption. And they do much more construction and mining, and they have affluence, their affluence absolutely depends on the size of their territory, size and quality of their territory. That's why they fight over territory all the time. Well, in the industrial, they are characterized by fossil fuel use and an even further increase of domesticated animals. <clears throat> so let's talk about technology. And if you talk about impact upon the Earth, of course, you could have very different impacts. You could discuss biodiversity impacts. You could discuss toxicological impacts. So that's what I'm not doing. I really focus on carbon as the well, climate relevant emission that we have. And what I say about technology here all refers to carbon. So the wood fire preparation of food means there is, there is carbon emissions. The only major carbon emissions of hunters and gatherers is if they use fire for extinguishing or changing the vegetation of the land. But we believe in the end that 
this is compensated by vegetation regrowth. So this impact is very small if it's there. They have hardly any technological development because technological development in hunting gathering is self-defeating. So if you become much better in hunting and much better in exploiting the food base, then you have to travel faster. You have to change your location much more often. And that's not a very good idea. So it's better to stay with those technologies that your animals already know and keep a certain balance within the regions that you want to explore or exploit. So they are fairly carbon neutral. Agrarian societies transform forests, and that's the main effect that people like Rudiman uh, think of when they say the Neolithic Revolution started the Anthropocene. There's a large scale of deforestation of, of the land. And they, they lead to soil loss quite substantially. And they have technological development, and they need technological development, particularly because they have high population growth. And if they want to keep feeding a rising population, they need technological development. But per person, they don't become more affluent, because their technological advancement is eaten up by population growth. So very often, old agricultural cultures are poorer in the end, or a few centuries later than they had been before, irrespective of environmental destruction. Industrial. There we have, of course, fossil fuel combustion, fossil-based intensification of agriculture, which allows us <coughs> a certain degree of reforestation. That's a sort of positive effect, and with very fast technological development. So that's so far describe what's relevant for the iPad formula. The trouble is that we have a number of interactions, both between the factors mm -hmm. and between the regimes. And that makes the modeling of these processes a bit complicated. So with the agrarian regime, we have population growth that leads or requires labor intensification. And labor intensification means you have an further population growth because you have enough, you have to have enough children to do the work for you when you become older. So that's the Bozerub effect. You have therefore affluence declining usually. Old agrarian cultures are poorer in the end than they were at the beginning. But they outcompete hunters and gatherers. So if they are in a region where there are hunters and gatherers, if they start there, they take the best land, they have a much higher population density, they drive the hunter-gatherers to the periphery, and in the end, they extinguish them. Industrial, there you have a lot of interactions. Energy affluence leads to technological development, leads to economic growth, leads to more technological development. That's the a growth machine that Bob Ayers has been describing. Wage labor and technological development leads to low fertility and to low mortality, and in the end to population decline. And now interactions between regimes again. Trade and aid reduce the mortality in agrarian populations. And so when agrarian populations interact with industrial populations, you get a veritable population explosion. This is not a matter of industrialization. It's a matter of interaction. And, econ and what am I, conversion, yeah, that the industrial population keeps growing has not to do with her endogenous growth, but has to do with, I put it in, in brackets, conversions. So we have a lot of conversions to the industrial mode, both by migrants who come to our countries, but even more so by development in other countries that mimic our mode. So that's the sort of qualitative understanding, and I will lead you now what that helps to get at some quantitative estimates. So how to arrive at population estimates is my, is my first theme I have to deal with. Before 10,000 BC, probably the whole human world population were hunters and gatherers. We can estimate their growth because we know about Aust 
Oceania and about America and so on. We know about regions where there were only hunter-gatherers. And there we arrive at a plausible growth rate of very low, of, of 3,000 annually. If this happens, they would arrive at 90 millions at Christ's birth, at, at Anno Domini I. And the rain, remaining world population should already be agrarian. At that time, we have about 200 million world population, or 180 or something like that. So that's one way to distinguish between hunter-gatherers and agrarian. But we can use a socio-metabolic cross-check, because we know when urban centers emerged, but that we know from, from anthropology, uh, archaeology. And we know that if there is an urban center, there must be an agrarian population, because hunter-gatherers don't found cities. And it, in the early phases, it takes about 98 farmers to feed one inhabitant of a city. This improves a little to, you can, to 3.5. But if we use this estimate and the existing estimates of urban population, we can generate a second estimate of how many agrarian population must have been at what time. And fortunately, I was very relieved to find that these two estimates end up with the same numbers. Oh. <laughs> so, and then we, we think a dominance of agrarian population drives hunter-gatherers into extinction or conversion. By 1500. So that's the first distinction of hunter-gatherer agr agrarian populations. I have at least the same problem with <coughs> distinguishing between agrarian and industrial populations. So one assumption is, as I said before already, urban populations beyond 3 or maximum 4 percent in cases of trade cities at the, at the ocean that can import a lot, it may be 10%, but in agrarian regime, there's never more than 10% 10, 10 urban population that cannot be sustained by traditional farming. And the usual is between two and three and four. So we checked a lot of countries whether this is correct. And then we checked that urban population sizes are very, very closely linked to fossil fuels. And so I show you the, I show you the numbers, just next, next slide. And that's what we relied upon. So we said, we call, after 1500, we call everything an industrial population that lives in cities. That's a generous move, I agree. But it can be, in the, in the background, it can be well argued. So this is much more than the current OECD 18% or 20% that we have. But there is no estimate of industrial populations backward. Yeah? So we had to do it. Yeah, we equate industrial population with urban population. Here is a nice show just for one of few countries, how large can urban populations become from 1500 on? And there you see UK rocketing because it has its goal. You see, not so well, but still, the Netherlands zipping up because it had peat, it used peat, but it ran out of peat, unfortunately, and the British wouldn't export their coal to the Netherlands because they were competitors. So the Netherlands had their golden age, but then they sort of leveled out. But the UK took off and exported its coal to everybody. So here is the line that shows the link between urban population and fossil fuel use globally. The data is it's Klein Goldeweig's population data, uh, urban population data, so it's uh, in, uh, urban centers of 2,500 plus, I think, inhabitants. So this is, I mean, I was a little bit shocked when I saw this line, honestly. But I trusted it for my estimate, so it was useful. Okay, and so there you go with the population estimates. And I show you up to 1,600 in the first slide. The green is the hunter-gatherers, the blue is the agrarian populations. They explode pretty much so. 
and then this is a different scale from 1500 onwards because you wouldn't see anything if I used the scale on the left. And there you see it was mainly the agrarian growth, or the agrarian growth in population had a very, very strong impact on the overall population growth. You can look at this as a, as a whale in, in shares. <laughs> so the, the tail of the whale would be much longer because the x-axis is not proportional. But what you see is that you, there was a takeover at about Christ's birth. The hunter-gatherers were outnumbered by the agrarian population. And now we are about at the point where the industrial population will outnumber the agrarian population. So that's population. Now I go to affluence. What's affluence? I already explained that the DC is a little bit of another measure that we use because it's better, it's better adapted to long historical comparisons. And we have a historical database for many countries uh, that, that checks this DC. So it's fairly, fairly robust numbers. If I talk about affluence in terms of energy, it's not just energy. We have energy allows us to move material. That's a physical relation. This physical relation expresses itself in an excellent correlation between materials use and energy use. So when I talk about energy affluence, I mean affluence in stuff just as well. So we can use much more stuff. So let's look at the metabolic rates in terms of energy across history. Uh, please be aware that's a logarithmic scale. And if we have the, the hunter-gatherers, because of their fire, firewood, they already have twice or three, no, more, four times, three times uh, the energy use than, than, than the primate of our size. The agrarian have another. So this is a practically a log linear function if we <coughs> allow allow that to be a nominal scale at the bottom. Uh, trouble is that we cannot continue. Our next transition cannot continue on that line Yeah, that everybody should be aware of. But so we have to part from long history, not just from a little bit of 300 history, 300 years of history. OK, now I put the energy in. And the black line is the population. And again, the separation of time periods. What you see, the energy adds quite a lot to the impact. So it's not just population growth. If we had only population growth, it wouldn't be all that bad. But we couldn't have that population growth unless we had a growth in energy. That's the intrinsic relation that we have to be aware of. So another whale. And the whale here shows that uh, even before Christ, the uh, agrarian populations have overtaken in terms of energy, have to overtaken hunter gatherers. And the industrial population now already consumes almost 80% of the world's energy, including biomass energy. So that's very, very substantial. So, preliminary <coughs> conclusions from population and affluence. And what about technology? So, human impact on Earth um, up to 1500 increased fivefold. Energy and population had about half the share in it. From that time onwards, the increase is much steeper. It more than doubles in the 300 years after 1500, where we have the so-called Industrial Revolution. From 1700 on, it doubles per century. From 1900, it doubles in 50 years. And from 1950, it triples in 50 years. So it's an accelerating impact. <coughs> so did technology do any good? Did it in the long run help to mitigate the impacts from population <coughs> affluence? The answer is disconcerting. Within socio-metabolic regimes, it did. But the technology shifts between the regimes make things worse. So this is kind of the numbers we use for estimates. And let's look just at the, uh, uh, down there at the technology <coughs> coefficient. 
we give for carbon emissions, we give the hunter-gatherers a zero. Could be a little more, but it's okay. In, for the agrarian regime, the technology coefficient is more than 10, which means more than 10 tons of carbon per gigajoule of used energy by people. And this was higher in the beginnings, so people learned to do agriculture more efficiently and to use more human labor power for it and less land for it and less deforestation for it, but still it's, well, it stays in this range. Pretty similar for the industrial regime that starts off with about 13 gigajoule of ton per unit carbon, if you combine the the, the food production and the industrial production. And it may be 25. No, in the beginning it was rather 25, and then it came down to about 13 uh, tons of carbon per gigajoule, because coal was much more carbon intensive per unit energy than gas, for example, is, or the current energy production mix is. Yeah, but that means technology so far hasn't really rescued us. And now that's the iPad curve, if you will, across from, from Christ's birth to the year 2000. What you see, the population had the strongest impact, so it, was, it increased 36-fold. Energy affluence multiplied this effect by three and carbon intensity multiplied this effect by two. So that's where we are, that's where we go. And of course, these informations are not independent. Some better news, finally, for our century, for you. So for the first time, you did not say so, so far, but I believe these projections from what I see it is projected that human population growth will <coughs> decline and probably turn negative within this century. Either from 2035 onward, as Lutz from Yasa says, from 2050, or, or Randers also says 2035, other Yasa estimates and, the, and some UN estimates go for 2050. So this will be the first century in human history where human population growth is stalled, at least. So this is something, this, and I hope not at 9.7 billion. Then I link up to uh, Steve Running, what, what Steve Running was saying. Since the 1970s, per capita energy and material use in mat mature industrial countries stagnate. We have been investing a lot of time into this analysis. It's true for the US, it's true for Europe, it's true for Japan, it's true for all of OECD. It's not so clear why this happens. And it, we did analyze, does it only have to do that we let others produce the commodities that we use? It's not just that. There is a substantial efficiency increase. We can do more with less at least remains after, after subtracting the impact of trade that is important. This level where we stagnate is definitely uh, much too high for the rest of the world to catch up with it. So we cannot, on one earth, have a convergence of all the world population on that level. This is, this is not possible. We have to go for contraction of this metabolism in order for the others to converge and reduce the inequality around the world. We will not be able to avoid that, and we will be forced to if we don't like it. So I'm, I'm in the, working in the UNEP panel for, inter, for, for resource use, and we're doing a lot of resource use analysis of metals, of biomass, of water, of whatnot, and it looks, and we did, uh, scenarios for contraction convergence or stabilization and convergence and whatnot, and it is very clear that it is not compatible with the resource base of the Earth. 
just to have convergence, everybody living like us. This will not do, and we will have to understand that. And if we don't understand, it will be forced upon us. Yeah, and finally, but this stagnation, just uh, one more word. We have been looking into the politics at the time when this stagnation started. It started in all those countries in the early 70s, around the first oil price peak, but not necessarily there. Sometimes a little bit before, a bit, bit later. And we've been trying to analyze a number of countries. What did politics do at that time? So was there a change? Was there a structural change just in the economy? Or, or was there a change in public perception, in communication, in policy making? Well, there was a change in policy making. And to my, well, I'm very sorry about that. One has the impression the right things started to happen at that time, in the 70s. Many reasonable political decisions, analyses, directions, visions were developing. Also in higher level, uh, among higher level actors. And then there was a rollback in the 80s to push all that aside and go for economic growth. And you can really see that in the policy cycle and you can reflect it in the energy cycle and in the material cycle that we, we analyze. Okay, so now, but my last slide is approaching. I, th I, I announce it by saying that humanity finally has started to learn how to create a good quality of life, one of the issues of the symposium that you have been organizing at lower energy and material standards. And I'll show it again very quantitatively by data from Julia Steinberger and Timmons Robbins. If we look at the relation between per capita energy use, in this case it's TPS, and HDI, the UN measure of quality of life, in the year 1975, with all the countries that have enough data to show, we can see that just a little bit more energy can improve the quality of life fantastically. But then not much happens. So you can easily increase your energy consumption without your quality of life giving in. But let's now look at 1980 and 1985 and 1990. 95, 2000, 2005, what happens? These regressions come down all the time. They are fine, absolutely nice coefficients. They come down in this 30 year period by two thirds. So today, we are able, or in 2005, we are able to achieve a high human development, 0.85, which is about Italy, not so bad, yeah? <laughs> With a little bit more than, not the, it, these, these red lines always shift and that these things move independently, that's very bad. But with about 70 gigajoule per capita, energy consumption, and we used to need 220 or 30 in the year 1975 to get at that same achievement. And we have tested this kind of, and the, and the distance between these, these curves is constant. So it's not declining, it's not squeezing up, it's going on like this. And we have tried to test that for life expectancy, for education, for child mortality, you get the same thing. For carbon emissions, you get the same thing. And Steinberger recently published that in Nature Climate, including trade. And it still comes out the same. So we are able, our humanity is able to learn. The trouble is, so I, I'm sorry. But we don't do it. Thank you.
So move over. Yes, we'll move over there. If I could invite the uh, two discussants for this panel to join us at the table in the front. Dr. Fisher-Kowalski for uh, thought-provoking remarks. Just like the first session, we will follow a similar format where we will invite two discussants to react to Dr. Fisher-Kowalski's um, talk, and then we'll invite some questions from the audience. Let me first introduce the first discussant, who is Anne Wywoody, uh, who is the Michigan director of the Sierra Club. She works uh, with both the state legislative program and the environmental protection education campaign at the Sierra Club and has worked on a wide range of issues including forests, sprawl, and more recently concentrated animal feeding operations or so-called factory farms. Anne works extensively with the environmental law program to use litigation as a critical tool for saving the environment. So welcome, Anne. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, we had the uh, up note at the end of uh, Dr. Kowalski's uh, speech because I was, uh, it's been a hard morning already, I think, for us. So, and, and I think being in the business of what can be done uh, is extremely important because uh, as, as has been said, political will is an awful lot of this of what moves us forward, that, that there are the excuses that we hear about why things can't happen tend to be mired in those who are not really interested in the long-term well-being of, of, uh, of humanity, but more in their short-term vested interests and how we loosen up that discussion so we're actually facing the future in a productive way is extremely important without being sort of, you know, pie in the sky, Pollyanna-ish. Uh, and I, I was particularly intrigued, I mean, that this, the progression that's occurred through history uh, and how that affects our ability to uh, expand as humanity is extremely important to understand. I, it's the, one of those things that I think you sort of intuit, but until you actually see it laid out, it's difficult to really appreciate how much we drive these choices. And that is in our individual choices, it's in our political choices, it's in a whole range of choices that, that humans make and have the opportunity to make. It's in what we choose to study. I mean, if we're, I think that's one of the things that, that is frustrating to a lot of people today uh, and also hopefully something that gives us hope. Uh, we see examples of people making good choices and moving the needle towards a less energy intensive future without a loss of quality of life everywhere. Uh, they don't tend to draw the attention that happens with the bigger deals, with the, uh, with the fights in Congress, with the uh, IPCC reports. But there are people, um, I know a woman who's lived off the grid on, on Whitefish Bay in Lake Superior for 20 years grows most of her own food, heats her house with the wood that she has around her, and my guess is her carbon imprint, except for the fact that she travels, is very low. She didn't do it because somebody said you have to do it. She did it because it made sense to her. <clears throat> and when we talk about how we make these transitions, it's about making sense. And what I find encouraging is that the movement, the sustainability movements of various sorts are actually about people making sense about correlating what they do in their own lives with what happens in society. Right here at MSU, one of the things that I've been delighted to see is the growth of the organic farming uh, pod that uh, uh, in the midst of industrial agriculture, that's a, that's a pretty hard 
lift, and it's an important one that's happening. It's oversubscribed, uh, and we see that the rise of, uh, of farmers markets and sustainable agriculture, uh, people buying, putting faith in that farmer that this year's crop is going to be something that they're going to be able to buy. Uh, but at the high levels of decision making, we're still emphasizing agricultural trade as opposed to sustainability. And we're still emphasizing exporting technologies that are really not relevant for for communities outside of uh, our own country and are no longer relevant for our own. This is about switching direction. And the thing about what we've seen is that change is inevitable. It's more a question of how we choose to make that change and what direction we take it in. For those who <laughs> resist change, fine, go ahead, fight back. There are a lot of them down the street if you follow uh, Michigan Avenue all the way to the end. You'll meet a lot of them right now. Uh, I believe there are 148 in session next week. They're out of, out of session this week. It's a, extremely important though that we recognize that the capacity for change is actually here. It is, it's being lived. It's being experienced, it's being taught to people. And while a lot of people do say we depend on young people, I'm sorry, I depend on people my age. I depend on a lot of people to stand up for what we know is right and move those needles and make sure those choices are the right ones. And those choices are made in every, every decision you make. Whether it's how you, what you're gonna buy today for dinner, what you're gonna plant to grow this summer, where you're gonna take your vacation and how you're gonna get there. And for me, I've got a grandson who's now two years old. If I don't calibrate every decision I make on what I'm leaving for him and use that as the impetus for the change that needs to happen, the direction we need to go in, then I am abandoning his future. So I appreciate the opportunity to offer some comments. Thank you, Ms. Wywoody. Uh, I'll introduce our second discussant at this time. Dr. Pio Johannes Schweitzer is a visiting scholar at MSU uh, who comes to us from the University of Stuttgart in Germany. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Stuttgart, where she is a senior researcher at the Stuttgart uh, Research Center for Inter Interdisciplinary Risk and Innovation Studies. At this center, she leads a research group on the potentials and limits of public participation for planning sustainable energy infrastructures. Welcome, Dr. Schweitzer. Thank you very much, and also thank you for this great opportunity to be a panelist here. It's a great honor, thank you. Um, I would like to offer a brief perspective from sort of a German point of view on this issue. As you probably all know, Jim, the German government has decided on the nuclear phase out, on the energy transition. So this is an, a very individual and novel approach to uh, this whole issue. The uh, political background and the political decision making has already taken place. And there are high expectations involved with this uh, energy transition. The key characteristics are the total nuclear phase out, an increase in energy efficiency and the replacement of fossil and nuclear energy with renewables. So this is the background of the German energy transition and my research group and actually a large research uh, alliance called Energy Trans is in charge of facilitating this energy transition, providing input of how to really put it into practice. So this is the big question for us and I would like to uh, take up this opportunity to get some new um, insights and comments how we could facilitate the German energy transition. 
Actually, the expected results of the German energy transition are an increased ecological sustainability, the energy independence from our European neighbors, including Russia, and security of energy supplies. Increased intergenerational justice, economic growth through export of green technology and expertise, and also environmental protection. So this is quite quite something. It's it's quite it's quite a bundle of high expectations, and the open question still is how to put that into practice. So I would like to raise up the, the panel discussion and to raise a couple of critical issues, first of all to our speaker, but also to all of you. First is, what is actually green growth? If we are expected to sort of keep up our, uh, st uh, our lifestyle of actually um, increase economic growth with green growth, then what are green technologies and are the renewables or our, is, it, is it really feasible uh, to um, move way forward and out of this technological lock-in in fossil fuel uh, consumption with green fuels? Also, what about the technological feasibility? Can renewables really live up to these high expectations? Yesterday, at, the, um, uh, at another symposium here on the Great Lakes and climate change in the Great Lakes region, we heard that actually biofuels are, um, or their impact is overestimated by a lot of researchers that the technological feasibility of biofuels to reduce the amount of, um, of fossil fuels and nuclear energy and the energy mix is not that high as researchers expect. Also, every technology and every technological use comes with its own risks and benefits. Even green technologies involve risks. So we have to do a risk-benefit analysis, but who is in charge of that? Do we leave that to the government? Do we involve stakeholders? Do we involve the public in decision-making? All of this, these are critical issues from my point of view. Then also, if we rely on renewables, there will be a massive increase in energy price. Let's face it, that's how it is. And then who is going to pay how much for clean energy? And is the individual consumer willing to pay this burden for this burden of clean energy? Is there uh, an equitable um, sort of spread of, of the burden of this risk associated with green energy? Also, with regard to socio-technological lock-in, in my point of view, there's not only a technological lock-in, but this technological lock-in always is coupled with the socio-political aspect to it. Um, are we too much locked into our lifestyles and habits to change our trajectory at the moment? Then all of this also leads to govern governance aspects. What are the best ways to enforce these changes, regulation, inf what are the enforcement strategies in place? Are there financial incentives? All that question about carbon tax and the different approaches in different countries. 
That's just a glimpse or that's just the top of the iceberg if we really want to change our ways with regard to fossil energy use. And lastly, the ethical considerations we need to uh, bear in mind. What is responsible development? <coughs> what is responsible technological innovation and responsible green growth? Who is in charge of making these decisions? And from my point of view, we need to tap the full potential of representative democracy and maybe even come up with some fresh ideas for new governance innovations and new ways forward uh, out of technological lock-in and how to change our ways with regard to fossil energy uh, use without sacrificing our convenient lifestyle, which we are used to. So thank you very much. Intriguing questions. Dr. Fischer-Kowalski, would you like to respond to either of those comments? Yes, I, I mean, I'm tempted to. <laughs> you're, you're invited. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think I'd first respond to her, because you were giving such a, a nice, comforting speech, yeah? but, but that doesn't provoke me to, to, to new comments. I think what has to be said, you said, so that's fine. But with you, uh, just, just a small comment. At the moment, there is big trouble in Australia. I know Australia is nice weather, but the coal industry in Australia wants to get subsidies because it's competed out of business by the photovoltaics. And so it is not necessarily so that renewable energies are more expensive than the energies we have. And there's a lot of, I mean, I'm not a technology expert, much less than you are, but if I look at those instances that come to my knowledge, I must say there is a lot moving. Second, I'm, where are we? Uh, these, maybe these Europeans are always, um, uh, there's a prejudice that they always refer to history. But now we are, <laughs> now we are 200 years after the famous Vienna Conference in 1815, where all the, the, the heads of states worldwide convened with a big relief that they had finally fought Napoleon, that all this unrest was gone, that they could now stabilize their regime based on agrarian surplus, based on, uh, on the big owners of property, and that all this, this, uh, this, uh, un this uh, unrest would finally be extinguished. Yeah? So that's what they happily decided in 1815. And they said we'll have a century of peace in Europe and worldwide, and we'll get a hold on all the affairs that have been gone out of grip, and it will be good times. You, you know a little about the 19th century? <laughs> so I'm always a little bit hesitant about our ability to steer so complex systems as the ones we deal with. I don't think, I mean, decisions are fine and responsibility is fine, but we should not believe, and particularly our leaders shouldn't believe, that they have on everything under control. This is absolutely not so. And we will go into a lot of surprises. And what I only hope for also in in view on my four-year-old grandchild, uh, that these surprises won't be too tough on us. They could be very, very unpleasant. And some of them are inevitably going to be very, very unpleasant. But I hope that we also have political and, and, and also economic surprises in a positive sense. I, I think we will. And that Merkel is standing up and saying, as long as my car industry isn't injured too much, I'll do the energy transition, is great. Yeah, I, I think this is great. But there's a lot of pressure on her, and I hope she, 
she keeps standing, and I hope she gets more company than she now has. This is all very fragile. This is very fragile. Yeah, that's. Thank you for those comments. So if I could begin with a, a question that was submitted by a student from Michigan State University uh, to this panel. The question is, with so many global and local economies dependent on the energy <laughs> sector, how can we relinquish control of energy sources while avoiding economic catastrophe? I assume this reference to relinquishing control of energy sources refers to the fact that uh, currently, uh, energy is held in such concentrated power, uh, which I think makes many people feel globally and locally quite helpless. Uh, we're told that this could, uh, could imply economic catastrophe. So how do you address the student's question about this energy transition while avoiding economic catastrophe? Ms. Great, thanks. That's, a, that's the kind of question that should be being asked because there are answers to it. The, uh, first, uh, as I mean, as we talked about before, there is uh, inherent change. It, it happens, and so uh, one of the things that Sierra Club has tried to do, as we're trying to shut down every coal plant in the United States, and I want to be very clear, that is our objective: uh, that we get out of the coal business and that we don't ship coal overseas. Uh, but that we look to communities like here in, in Michigan, uh, River Rouge uh, in Michigan, Trenton Channel, both of them, uh, Trenton has a, uh, both of them have uh, coal-fired power plants. They are heavily dependent uh, for tax base on those coal plants. They also have a number of jobs that are there. We need to assure that the utilities that have been able to make quite a profit out over that over time are held accountable for the transitions. Uh, the same in the coal fields, uh, that this is something that we owe these folks. And I think it's important that we do realize that renewable energy now is increasingly cost competitive. In Michigan, it's cheaper to build a wind farm than it is to build any fossil fuel farms today or uh, facilities today. That's a fact. And it's important for us to recognize that we need to assure that the transitions happen in an equitable and reasonable way, but they do happen. Uh, what, what is the greatest concern is that folks look to each individual situation out of context and say what we need to do is prop up that particular outdated technology, keep people spewing pollutants into the air, uh, damaging health, damaging the future. Uh, that's the wrong response, and it's the one that we have to fight back against. Other responses? Right. Um, in quite a few German regions, there is, uh, we are, well, local areas, there is the, uh, there are initiatives to become s uh, energy self-independent or self-sufficient, and it's actually quite a race one mayor against the other, who, whose small town will become first energy self-sufficient. There are a lot, quite a lot of options reaching this goal with solar panels, with uh, biomass uh, facilities, other options as well. The idea basically is to involve the individual citizen as a sort of a producer and consumer of energy. So this dual role, this simultaneous dual role as a prosumer, as a producer and consumer, I think is important here that uh, the individual citizen takes over an active role in the production of energy, however minor. That's not the point at, of scale at the moment. But um, I think with all of the, the potential or, or with that huge task of the energy transition, this is a small step forward, but it's definitely one step in the right direction. 
Yeah, I mean, I come from Austria, it's a very small country. Um, I, uh, I want to reconfirm that changing democratic processes is an important feature of managing, or not managing, but making a transition possible. And with us, for example, in 1978, there was a built power plant, atomic power plant in Austria, and there was a big campaign against it, and all established policy forces were in favor of it. The big parties were in favor of it. The labor union was in favor of it. The union of the employers was in favor of it. Everybody who had anything to say in Austria was in favor of it. And then our Chancellor Kreisky said, well, if there is so much excitement about it, let's do a, a, a referendum. And the referendum had 50.2% against the power plant. And it was, and they tried to reopen it, then came Chernobyl, then came a few other things. So now it's a gas, a gas power plant, and Austria became a convicted anti-nuclear country that stands up for that in every international meeting. The next issue was 84. There, our energy, our uh, electricity producers had run a strategy of increasing an electricity supply all the time. And they had always done projections how much electricity we will need next year and in 10 years' time, and that we absolutely need new plants and so on to supply that. And this had already been under criticism. And then they wanted to do another damming of the Danube a little bit east of Austria, uh, of Vienna. And there was a nice forest, not a real primary forest, but a, a riverine forest, which is nice. There was a huge revolt against this. Well, and it wasn't built. It wasn't built. And since then, the, and they cannot argue with their projections that we will ever need ever more electricity, but they have to run at least a few strategies of reducing energy, electricity use. And in that time, they even propagated that we should better warm our water at night with electricity, because they had already a little bit of a trouble keeping up their growth rates. Yeah, So they, they propagated, let's use warm water from electricity. So we, we mustn't believe everything. And in these two cases, against the full establishment, in both cases, the decisions were taken. And I think in many countries there are processes like this. And they are, each country is a little bit different in how its politics are organized and how its public consciousness are organized. And the murder countries are a bit in a particular trouble. But I think regular politics won't do it. I don't think so. I don't see any major transition in human history where regular politics did it unless a few others have already done it and it's sort of adapted to it. Yeah? But I don't believe in that. I think we need new forms of democracy to take that forward. Thank you. At this time, uh, I'd like to invite questions from the audience. If you could stand and introduce yourself. Uh, do we have an extra mic? Do you want to use mine? Or? So you see you. Here's a microphone coming just now. We're on, we're recording though, so. That question came up about um, the economics of making these decisions that it costs people more to do sustainable or renewable energy. Um, and I can't, maybe you can help me out. Um, years ago, I heard about a center um, for ecological economics, I might have that wrong, out of Denver, where a man was uh, measuring the economics of um, not doing sustainable or renewable energy, like um, ways to measure um, the cost of polluted air and water. We do it catastrophe by catastrophe. Oh, this many billions of gallons, it's cost this much to clean it up. But I think the whole part that's missing in everything is the economics of not um, doing what we need to do. And we see that in the disasters with the um, the climate change um, from <laughs> our polar vortexes here to the increase in tornadoes and the damage to whole coastlines and everything. So it's too bad that the economic system in this country hasn't ever incorporated the costs of 
um, not taking care of the environment. It's, it's not. And, and there was some kind of center where they did that, and I never heard about it again. But if anybody knows um, about that, tell me, because I, I lost touch with what the name of it was and who was behind it. Okay, if thank it still you. exists. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Anyone like to respond to that? Yes. So, uh, first, saving energy is the most cost effective thing you can do, period. Uh, and the, I think there, again, one of the challenges we face is actually getting the factual information out there. There's tremendous subsidies that occur for fossil fuels in this country, and we just heard about Australia as well. This is, uh, that's part of the reason that they continue to be um, propagated and used and, and expanded. Uh, the, and the other thing that I think we, we don't do an adequate job of is recognize that the use of energy is inherently waste. I mean, we used to talk about trying to reduce our waste streams, but the more energy you use, the less efficient you are, the less cost effective it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, energy is not an end that we seek. Energy is a tool. And so our most eff efficient use of it, the less, less of it we use, the more that we use that is, is from, non, uh, from renewable sources as opposed to non-renewable sources, the better off we are uh, economically. It means that we're translating more into to actual useful products and services as opposed to spending our time actually getting stuff there. So I think it's important for us to make those changes. But the facts right now in Michigan are, again, I'll, I'll repeat that uh, renewable energy is cheaper than any of the fossil fuels for electricity. And energy efficiency is by far the cheapest thing we can do, regardless of what it is, whether it's in our, our vehicles or in our buildings, uh, which are our biggest energy losers. Uh, that's really where we need to make sure that people don't get away with thinking that it costs too much to do renewable. We need to do it because it's actually cheaper and better. Other yes, thank you. Um, I absolutely agree that each and every decision involves risks and benefits. Also doing nothing is a decision we take and involves risks and benefits. The crucial issue I would like to raise, and your awareness and our awareness actually, is who is doing this risk-benefit analysis? And who is responsible for doing it? And who will take the decision for all of us? Who is involved in the decision-making process? And is there maybe a better way of decision making, a better way of governance, more inclusive way of governance, because the burden of all of this, Leitrin and I absolutely agree with you on that, it has to be taken by each and every individual. And we have to be aware of that or at least bear this issue in mind. Yeah, I, I, maybe you think I'm a little bit cynical, but it is, it is not the way we think how we save cost in the future. We would have never waged wars, we would have not done a lot of things if we had ever tried to spare cost in the future. We like that things happen that destroy the things that we have because it gives us a good opportunity for growth, green or blue or whatever. And this is, we like that. And so this is the logic of Stern's report and also of a lot of very serious co calculations done by ecological economists. But this is not the way the interests work. And that's the trouble. So I am a bit hesitant about, or at least I don't put all my heart into these cost projections because they don't make a difference. Would the US have waged a war against Iraq if it had it done it by cost calculations? Or that's your student's question again, yeah? Could they control the oil that way? No. Yeah? And so we do a lot of things that will cost us more in the future because we have the interest to do so. The constellation of interests is that way. We are not very rational. 
Um, so my basic question is green growth and oxymoron or a myth, um, and I'll explain that a little bit. Um, does it matter if we're getting less carbon intensive energy to still consume the world's natural resources for commodity goods? Um, and the uh, energy density of renewable energy is not really talked about, but the an energy return on energy invested for a petroleum that fueled this type of complex society was 100 to 1 in 1900. Uh, renewable energy is like 4 to 10, something like that. They, they probably won't be able to support the type of complexity soci the complex society to produce them. They're essentially fossil fuel derivatives. Um, now that being said, we live on an energy, s we're, 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 we're living on energy subsidy um, to have the type of society that we live in and not produce food. We don't have to grow our food, right? And 80, 95 percent of people are growing food. Even 100 years ago, 80 percent of people in America were growing food. Um, so I've seen some estimates that maybe 17 percent with modern sustainable agriculture will need to be growing food. But it's still a massive transition, a huge radical rethinking of the way that we think about the world, industrial supply streams, localism. Um, so is, is green growth helpful to think about? Or should we just be talking about an entirely radically new way of thinking about organizing society? Thank you. Who would like to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, i happy to rise to a controversy, but the, I think that, I, first off, the agriculture is pretty fundamental. Water quality is pretty fundamental. Water availability is pretty fundamental. Some of the things that we consider part of, uh, that we, I think, just think of as our quality of life are not essential pieces and I think that was one of the important things in, in the presentation that there is a there is a quality of life issue that is is actually can be sorted out that is is extremely important uh, and one of my greatest fears is that it takes 1500 miles to, to bring most of the, the uh, products that we eat Probably, I mean, I think I saw melon here today. Right, melon, sorry, that's not happening in Michigan. And it, it may not even be happening in the United States. Getting it here is, is a waste uh, that we can, we have to figure out how to get past. The Central Valley of California is about to go into one of the worst droughts that they've ever had. That's where most of our food, our vegetables come from right now. We need to figure out how that, that this is not just about uh, switching a piece of the, of the puzzle. The whole puzzle is shifting. And we have to figure out how to do green growth. One of the advantages, one of the reasons I like living in the Great Lakes region is that we grow enough food in Michigan to feed everybody in Michigan. We have water here. I have sons on either coast, I'll tell you. They are planning to be here when the when it hits because they are you know one lived through sandy and is works on climate change issues and the other lives in oakland california and they don't have enough water we we don't have a choice we are going to and and i think this is the thing that may come to me most importantly out of this we will confront these issues whether we do it in an, in an intelligent informed way or we simply let the catastrophes hit and then deal with it is up to us. Um, right. I would actually like to uh, um, sort of elaborate on that argument in the same direction. The thing is how to um, come to rational decision making and that goes to your very critical comment you uh, very critical issue you raised before then that people just are not rational enough to come to the right decision i doubt that for a very specific reason maybe the right procedures are not in place but we could work on that we could work on the rational decision making and the deliberative decision making so that those who are going to bear the burden of all of these negative aspects we have to face in the future with regard to green growth 
and our change in lifespan, like sacrificing a melon for an apple. Um, for actually moving along with the energy transition and moving in the right direction, in the rationally right direction. Well, you don't expect me now to propagate green crops, yeah? And my criticism of rationality wasn't really a criticism of our individual minds, but and of our species and our endowment as a species, although one sometimes can have some skeptical <laughs> thoughts about this, but about the rationality of how our systems work. And they work by another rationality. They don't work to maximize human happiness. And they don't work to have a secure future. That's just not the way they work. And so I would, I would think that you are quite right with your provocative question that we need to change things. There's really uh, the, the uh, German Council of the Government, BBGU, uh, talked about a great transformation and they talked about that this has to happen also with a new organization of political decision making. I think that's what we are up to and I have the impression, I mean science plays a very important role in this. Science is one of the strong actors on the side of criticizing activities that risk climate change, um, showing that there will be very, very bad costs in the future for our health, for uh, ecosystem health and whatnot by certain policies. So science has become a major societal <coughs> actor, which in earlier transitions in humanity, it wasn't really, yeah? or it was fighting for a particular religion against another particular religion, which, which isn't exactly what uh, intelligence should be doing. And but we are now in a position that, who was talking today about female education? I mean, female education helps to stall population growth. I just imagine, in Iran, 20 years ago, a woman had on average seven children. A woman in Iran in 2010 has on average 1.5 children in 20 <coughs> years. And this is a number of countries all over the world where you have educated female populations and where you have males who try to keep women suppressed. The way they oppose to this is not having children. And you have that in the Mediterranean, you have that in, in, the, in the Near East, you have that in a number of Asian countries even. So we have change. Yeah? This is not possibly not performed by political very visible decision making, but if you look at the at the data below that, you see that things change, and this will come up to the surface, and it will mean a major change, and not just green growth. I have a question here first. Sorry about. Thank you. Um, my name is Catherine Motika. I'm not affiliated with um, any department or organization or anything, so I'm green at this. Um, but I have a couple of comments. Um, there's a social phenomenon that occurs when people see something happening in society where someone needs help. As long as there's other people around, they'll tend to not help and walk away from the issue. And I think that that is a large part of what might be occurring. Um, Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Uh, the other thing I'm thinking <laughs> that came to my mind is, I believe this was an Einstein quote, that the problems can't be solved with the same mind that created it. And as a population, a world population, we have one mind. So we, I think, need to think completely radically, um, pull from the deepest recesses of our souls and the highest powers, whatever we can, to come up with solutions. Um, I often say that if our solar system was, the planets in our solar system were um, the departments in a hospital, Earth would be in the emergency room, 
And um, I think it's really important that we look at it that way. And we try to somehow get the public to understand that carbon is the issue. Um, and I don't, you know, can we s come up with a meme or something? I mean, as much as we know Siri and iPhone and and uh, did you, did and you have a else. question for them? Yeah, well, my question is, um, how can we bring this about? How can we how can we convince? You know, the issue is carbon. It's carbon, and how can we help society understand this? You know, what are some ways that we can, on just a real basic level, so that individuals can become involved, um, incorporate it into our lives, that carbon becomes really important to us as individuals. Thank you. Thanks. First off, I, I, I think there are an awful lot of people who do get that, and uh, our challenge is that uh, we still have a political system uh, in this country that just yesterday through the Supreme Court decided that uh, basically rich people can pretty much invest everything they want in uh, political influence uh, through electoral uh, investments. That uh, and that it is it is something that makes you cynical. Uh, every intern who comes in our office, we promise them they will be cynical by the time they leave. But the, the critical thing is that it not be debilitating. And uh, you know, Sierra Club is, is one example of an organization, and, and to be honest, there are a lot of Sierra Club volunteers and leaders out there. Thank you for coming to this. You folks are engaged, and they, uh, in fact, one of the challenges with a forum like this is this is the choir. Uh, I mean that that it's more about how do we how do we go out of here, and we don't have to ask people to tax.